so today i will be discussing a very important disease that is termed as hairspring disease which is also termed as congenital megacolon it is also known as congenital megacolon or a ganglionic mega colon so hairspring disease is also called as congenital megacolon meaning the disease is not acquired condition it is congenital mean hereditary also the mega colon means that here the size of colon is increases also it is called as a ganglionic mega colon a ganglionic means that the ganglionic nerves are absent now how will we uh, the condition is defined as we can easily define the condition by actually it is a congenital anomaly in which there is congenital absence of ganglionic nerve cells and the distal intestine mainly in colon so how we, we we can define the hairspring disease so it is a congenital anomaly in which there is congenital absence of ganglionic nerve cells and the distal intestine now what is actually ganglionic nerve cells now ganglia is actually it is the collection of cell bodies ganglia is collection of cell bodies in peripheral nervous system so it is the collection of cell bodies in peripheral nervous system while the nuclei is the collection of cell bodies and the central nervous system so when there is cluster of cell bodies and peripheral nervous system that is called as ganglia but if there is cluster of cell bodies and central nervous system so that is termed as nuclei now basically the ganglionic nerve cell it is responsible for movement of intestine so what is the what is the major function of ganglionic nerve cell actually it is responsible for intestinal movement so normally the ganglionic nerve cells it is present in the distal intestine now if there is congenitally if there is absence of ganglionic nerve cells so what happens that the intestinal movement is disturbed so if there is absence of ganglionic nerve cells so what happens that the intestinal movement is not occur so there will be no peristaltic movement there will be no peristaltic movement in intestine now if there is no any such movement in intestine so what happens that the fecal matter it it can can't pass from the body so fecal matter cannot pass from body as a result of that there is accumulation of fecal matter so accumulation of fecal matter and large intestine mainly in colon lead to the increase size of colon and when there is increase size of colon that is called as mega colon and that's the reason that disease is called as 
mega colonic disease and as it is a congenitally disorder so that's why it's called as congenital mega colon disorder so i repeat the ganglionic nerve cell it is responsible for movement of intestine so if there is absence of ganglionic nerve cells so the intestinal movement will be disturbed as a result of that there will be no any peristaltic movement occur in the intestine so there will be accumulation of fecal matter in intestine so and upon the accumulation of fecal matter it lead to the increased size of colon because of accumulation which lead to the condition of mega colon now there is another very important question which is the most common site of the hirschsprung disease so hirschsprung disease it is most commonly occur although it occur in every segment of the intestine but mainly it involve the large intestine so the most common site is most common site is colon and mainly more truly speaking that is recto sigmoidal colon recto sigmoidal colon so the most common site of hirschsprung disease is recto sigmoidal colon let's suppose this is a ascending colon this is a transverse colon followed by descending colon sigmoid rectum and anus so the recto sigmental portion and this portion that is recto sigmoidal portion it is more prone to cause the disease of hirschsprung disease so that's all about just and just an outline of hirschsprung disease now let's discuss the some of the important causes of hirschsprung disease now what are the causes of hirschsprung disease so the most common cause of hirschsprung disease that is a mainly chromosomal chromosomal abnormalities so let's discuss the etiological factors so the most common cause of hirschsprung disease that is chromosomal abnormalities chromosomal abnormalities and the chromosomal abnormalities mainly it is associated with the down syndrome it is associated with down syndrome also maternal infections are associated with hirschsprung disease maternal infections and certain teratogenic drugs can lead to a hirschsprung disease certain teratogenic drugs that is mainly carbamazepine and sodium valproate so the causes are chromosomal abnormalities mainly that is down syndrome and certain certain maternal infection can associated with the hirschsprung disease and certain teratogenic drugs like carbamazepine sodium valproate so these are important drugs that is associated with it also it include the uh, certain important uh, another drug that is thalidomide so thalidomide and carbamazepine is very important drug associated with this disease now what are the signs and symptoms of a patient if one is suffering from hirschsprung disease now the most what are the most cardinal features of the patient so let's discuss the signs and symptoms so the most cardinal feature or the most diagnostic clinical presentation is that is the the meconium is not passed in first 24 hour by child so it is very important and it is considered as the cardinal feature for the patient that the mainly the meconium is not passed by child in first 24 hour actually the meconium is the first tool that is passed by the child 
our baby. So here, if the baby is not passing the meconium in first 24 hours, so that would be leading to a if one of the important manifestation of Hirschsprung disease. Also, there is ribbon-like stools. There will be ribbon-like stools. So these two important features, these are called as the cardinal feature for the Hirschsprung disease. That is meconium is not passing, there is delay meconium passing and there is ribbon-like stools. And why it is so? Because the proximal portion, the A ganglionic portion that is affected, the just proximal to the A ganglionic portion, there is accumulation of fecal matter. So that accumulation of fecal matter, it exert pressure on the A ganglionic portion. So it lead to a, what happens that it lead to a passing of stools not properly so still there is passing of stools but that is in a 3d fashion because they have not so much occupying space for that so that's why it lead to a ribbon like stools so these are considered as the cardinal feature also there is abdominal distension in the in the patient there is abdominal distension also that is called as scaphoid shape abdomen so there is scaphoid shape abdomen and there is bile strain vomiting refuse to suckling It lead to refuse to suckling and there is improper weight gain there is improper weight gain and constipation and why constipation because of accumulation of fecal matter that lead to the constipation so the f symptoms are th that there is delay, delay meconium passing out ribbon like stools, abdominal distensions, bystand vomiting, refuse to suckling, improper weight gain and constipation. Now let's discuss the diagnostic evaluation of a disease. So mainly here in this disease we do the colonic biopsy. We do the biopsy of the large intestine. So the colonic biopsy is important and that colonic biopsy will show us the absence of it will show us the absence of ganglionic cells so the colonic biopsy will show us the absence of ganglionic nerve cells also we can do the ultrasonography and what ultrasonography will show us actually it will show us that the size of colon is increases so there will be mega colon it will show us a mega colon also there is an option of barium enema while the suction biopsy a rectal biopsy it is considered as the most confirmatory test these are the most confirmatory tests that is suction biopsy and rectal biopsy also electromanometry so I repeat the diagnostic evaluation is done by mainly colonic biopsy it will show us the absence of ganglionic nerve cells ultrasonography will show us the increased size of mega increased size of colon there is an option of barium enema suction or rectal biopsy is important and the electromanometry it is considered as one of the most important and basic and best screening test for the disease now let's talk about the management and treatment option for his spring disease so mainly the treatment option the choice of treatment is surgery so there are three surgeries options are available the first one is that is called as Swinson procedure that is called as Swinson procedure second there is called as Duhamel procedure Duhamel procedure and there is soft procedure 
So the treatment option is mainly surgery in the form of Swenson procedure, the Hamel procedure and Swerve procedure. Now what actually happens, what we do this procedure. Now let's suppose this is a ascending colon, this is transverse colon followed by descending colon, sigmoid colon and rectum. Now, as I told you earlier, the most common site is rectosigmoidal portion. So meaning, let's say if this is the aganglionic portion, meaning this area is affected. Let's suppose if this area is affected. Now what we will be doing in the case of Swinson procedure. In case of Swinson procedure, we reject this portion or we cut this portion and meaning the affected part or we can say the aganglionic portion or aganglionic segment of intestine it is rejected while they do the oblique and end to end anastomosis between the normal colon and the lower rectum so this is the procedure of Swenson procedure and Swenson procedure we re reject the aganglionic portion of the intestine and we do the oblique into an anastomosis between the normal colon and between the low, low rectum while coming to the Duhamel procedure and Duhamel procedure similarly we doing the we reject the uh, aganglionic portion of the intestine but here we not remove the affected part here we just pull the here we just pull the affected part or aganglionic part and upward and we do the end to end anastomosis between the normal colon and rectum. The only difference in the Duhamel procedure and Swenson procedure that in the Duhamel procedure when we reject the affected part so we not remove the entire part but in case of Swenson procedure we reject the part we remove the part at the same time. Now coming towards the swerve procedure and the swerve procedure what we will be doing here that let's say this is the affected part and this is the non-affected part. Now the non-affected part are we can say the ganglionic part as we know that these area are, all are full of ganglionic nerve cells which is responsible for the intestinal movement. Now in this procedure what we will be doing that the normal portion our ganglionic portion we pull the ganglionic portion from the one end and we pull the ganglionic portion from another end in such a way that we connect the both end of the normal portion of the intestine through the affected part of the intestine so this is occur this is done by sore and that's the reason it is called a sore procedure so these are the three surgical options in case of Hirschsprung disease that is Swenson procedure, Duhamel procedure and Swerf procedure. So the most common procedure is mainly it is Swenson procedure. So students that's all about the Hirschsprung disease and thank you so much.